So first of all, let me start by saying thank you everybody for being here today. My name's Ken and I am an alcoholic. So after you share your fifth step with somebody, go home, go to the park, go somewhere where, where you can have peace and quiet, not the movie theater, not the bar to shoot pool, sit quietly for an hour, carefully review the first five steps. It says carefully reviewing what we've done, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid to so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into our, the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? So at this point, for most of us, we're going to start to have this real spiritual experience. We're going to feel connected with God in a way that we've never have because we've cleared out a lot of what's been blocking us off from that relationship. So we have a conversation with God, plain and simple, very easy. Thanks for everything. This is great. If it's not great and we're still struggling with something, ask for help with that. Talk about that with your sponsor in that moment rather than moving forward. Okay, make sure you're solid on the first five steps. Top of page 76. Top of page 76. If we can answer to our satisfaction, then look at step six. We've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? Notice this next sentence. If we still cling to something, we will not let go. At first thinking, that looks redundant, right? If we still cling to something, we will not let go. Well, obviously, Bill, we know that. But what he's saying is if we still cling to something from our past, then we're not really letting go of our will. We're not really taking the third step. If you're still clinging to something from your past, if you haven't shared it in your fifth step, or you're holding on to some character defect that you identified in your fifth step, and you're not willing to let that go, then you're not really taking the third step. You're not really turning your thinking, your will, and your life, your actions, over to the care of God as you understand them. So it's not gonna work, because you're not trusting in God. It's not gonna work. You don't have the basis for the relationship that we need to move forward and stay sober. When ready, we say something like this. My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me. Good and bad, I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Sounds like exactly what we're talking about in doing the third step. Looking to see where we can contribute, where we can be of service, how we can be useful in the world, rather than looking to see how we can manage the world or make it be the way we think it ought to be. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. We have now completed step seven. So you can say any wording you want for that or you can read this prayer, whatever speaks to you, whatever works best for you. That's what you want to try and do. Now, we need more action. So we now pause after the seventh step. We're sitting quietly at our home for an hour. We move forward and we start doing the eighth step. So immediately after doing your fifth step, you sit down, you do six, seven, now you're doing eight. When you do your sixth and seventh step, you should have a list a good general idea of exactly how self works in your life that you got out of doing your fifth step or out of doing your fourth step and your fifth step. It's a good idea to write that list down so you have it with you so you can kind of check in as you're moving forward working the rest of the steps, staying sober and see how those things are present in your life. When we take the seventh step we don't magically get cured of our character defects. What's going to happen is some of them are going to be gone they're going to slip away. They're not going to be present for us anymore. But for the most part, we're going to have much more understanding and insight into how these things work in our life. And we're going to start seeing things very differently. And as we go through our day, we're going to see where we're being selfish. We're going to see where we're being dishonest. We're going to see where all these things are cropping up for us. And in those moments of having that awareness that that character defect is active, we get to choose whether we're going to act on the character defect or whether we're going to do something differently. So write your list of character defects down so you can look at them. Get a good idea for what they are for you. For some of us, we're not direct with others. We don't ever tell anybody what we really think or what we feel. We're fearful. We, will, you know, we walk around being afraid all the time. Whatever it is for you, you'll get your little list together. And then 
think about what the opposites in that list are. So that as you're spending time in your life, you can look at the list and you can see what's going on. You can see when those things crop up and you can have a conversation with God in that moment and say, hey, you know what? I see myself trying to be dishonest here. Instead, please help me to share exactly what's going on with me. Help me to be honest with how I feel. Whatever it is for you, whatever your list is, write the list and then write the opposites down so that you've got a good picture for yourself as to what those are. And you can look for them as you move through your day. Go to page 76, paragraph 3. Page 76, paragraph 3. Now we need more action. After every step, we get the same phrase, more action, more action. Without which, faith without works is dead. So right then and there, we start making our A-step list. And we've got that because we used our four-step list to put our A-step list together. So don't burn your four-step inventory yet. It's a good idea to keep that around for a few days. You're going to need it. There's some, somewhere along the line, somebody came up with this idea that as soon as you finish your fifth step, you burn your fourth step so nobody will ever see it, and so you get closure. But that doesn't work because you need it to go forward and make your eighth step list. Let's look at steps eight and nine. We've got a list of all the persons we've harmed and to whom we're willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. And through looking at that list, you'll come up with all the names of the people or most of the names of the people that you need to make amends with or make amends to. Now, the first thing you may be thinking, if you haven't written your fourth step yet, is, but my fourth step's about the people that wronged me. So why would I have to make an amends to them? You'll notice, when you're done with the inventory taking process, that there's lots of situations that we've been thinking about for years, about what they did wrong to us, and now we see that we ourselves in some way created or contributed to that situation. I know it's a surprise. Believe me, it's true. And, uh, and so we're going to start looking at these things from a different angle, and we're going to start seeing places where we're going to have to contact these people and make an amends. And the, the big book goes to great lengths to give us specific understandings for how to proceed with making that list, how to proceed with making those amends, because there's lots of different situations we can get in making the amends, and so Bill wanted to give us plenty of understanding about the best way to go about doing that. So it says, let's look at steps eight and nine. We, we, have, we have a list of all persons we have harmed and to, and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. So once again, here's a reference back to the third step. We see where self-will has been acting in our lives and where we've damaged our relationships with others, and now we're going to go try and straighten that stuff up. Probably there are still some misgivings. As we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we have hurt, we may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Let us be reassured. To some people, we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on our first approach. We might prejudice them. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. So what does he mean by that? What does he mean that this is not an end in itself? Just making the list is not enough? Think about what he says. He says, we're talking about dealing with people on a spiritual basis, and he says that we might prejudice these people at the moment we're trying to put our lives in order. So we're trying to put our lives in order. We're doing the nine steps so that we can put our lives in order. He says, but this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. We start working this eighth and ninth step. First, we make a list when we do our inventory of all these people, right, in our fourth step. We go back in the eighth step and we look over that list and we figure out all the persons that we need to make an amends to. In addition to all the people that we pull off our fourth step, we're going to think of lots of people that we've harmed that we need to make a ninth step amends to. So we put those on our eighth step list also. So it's everybody that came off our inventory, either the resentment inventory, the fear inventory, or the sex inventory, who we look over and we say, wow, I need to make amends to that person for something, and everybody else out there in the world that we may not have had a resentment against, but that we need to make an amends to so that we can put our lives in order.
Well, part of it is that we're trying to straighten out our lives. What happens if you don't go make an amends to somebody for something you did to harm them? And then you're walking through the mall one day and you see them coming at you in the mall. We look the other way. We, we walk the other way. We run. We avoid. Yeah, we avoid them. We become fearful, somebody else said. That's just what happens. Whenever there's something that we haven't dealt with in the past that's out in front of us, we get scared about it. In that position, are we living in self-will or are we living in God's will? In the idea that we started in the third step. Self-will. Yeah. Point blank. If we're walking around, right, the third step says driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. If we're walking around carrying this stuff from the past with us about what we've done to other people, then we're not in any kind of a position to be of service to God. So what the ninth step is telling us here is that putting our lives in order, in other words, cleaning up the wreckage of our past so that we don't owe people money and we don't, you know, have anything out there floating around that we still need to take care of, credit debt or with old relationships or any of that stuff, that's one part of the ninth step. But our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the world around us or the people around us. Think about it if you had some person that you had a resentment against. You did your four-step inventory, you got them on there, you got rid of the resentment, but now you knew that you had to owe them an amends. Because your resentment was that they stole $50 from you because they were your roommate in college. But then you said, well, you know what, they stole $50 from me, so what I did is I took their stereo and their TV and I pawned it. Because I deserved it. So now then you move out. And you screwed this guy over on his TV and his stereo. And now you're driving down the highway. You're not resentful anymore. You forgave him for stealing the $50, but you never made the amends. You see him broken down on the side of the highway. Are you going to stop and help him change his flat tire? No way. <laughs> never going to happen. Because you're fearful of having to have a conversation with him. Because you know you owe him something. So the real purpose of, of, of the ninth step the real purpose of the inventory taking process of everything we're doing up until this point is to get rid of aspects of self that block us off from God and fit ourselves to be of maximum service in the world around us. So we have to approach these people, we have to approach the idea of making our ninth step amends from the standpoint of I'm trying to clear out the stuff from my past, I'm trying to get rid of it, I don't want it to be there anymore. What an amend is, is to put a situation back into the state it was before we came along and screwed it up. That's what it means to amend something in the context that we're using the word here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to go back in our past in these relationships and we're trying to put these relationships in the order that they would have been before we did whatever we did that we owe the amend for, that we owe the apology for. So that's what we're trying to do. That's one thing that we're trying to accomplish in making our amends, to put right the situations from the past. The other thing that we're trying to accomplish is to get rid of the things that are blocking us from being service to God and the people in the world around us. And the third thing that we're trying to do is to live peacefully in our own skin. So we've got to go out and clean up these relationships so we don't walk around in fear of running into these people. Or getting put in a situation where you see somebody at a party somewhere and you, know, you never made the amends that you owed them and now you can't be at the party which means you can't be of service to other people that you may have to be at the party. So those are the things that we're trying to accomplish. Top of page 77, four lines down. Page 77, top of the page, four lines down. It is, it is so wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce that we have gone religious. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. We lay ourselves open to, be, to being braided fanatics or religious bores. We may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial, beneficial message. But our man is sure to be impressed with the sincere desire to set right the wrong. He is going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than in our talk of spiritual discoveries. What does that mean, Casey? It means he's going to want his money. He's going to want his money, <laughs> right? So if you owe somebody $50 and you call them up and you say, listen, you know, I, I stole your stereo and your TV when we were roommates in college and I pawned it and uh, 
you know I owe you fifty dollars but really what's happened now is I found a new relationship with a wonderful creator in my life and I'm sober and everything's great yeah. click the phone hangs up going to people who we've harmed and saying we've embarked on a relationship with God in order to achieve victory over alcoholism is going to leave them feeling like well okay you screwed me over because you were a jerk and now you're still a jerk and I'm still screwed over so they're going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than a talk of spiritual discoveries what that means is that if you owe somebody fifty dollars bring the fifty dollars with you or if you have to write them because you can't see them directly they live too far away or whatever it is write them a letter and send them the fifty dollars if you don't have the fifty dollars go in with ten dollars and tell them I can pay you ten dollars a week for the next five weeks whatever you have to do but have some good faith some action involved that shows that you're actually trying to set right the wrong actions go a lot further than talking about the spiritual condition that you're trying to develop the next paragraph a third of the way down the paragraph he says the question of how to approach the man we hated will arise it may be he has done more harm than we have done him and though we may have acquired a better attitude toward him we are still not too keen about admitting our faults nevertheless with such a person we dislike we take the bit in our teeth it's harder to go to an enemy than to a friend but we find it much more beneficial to us why do you suppose that is why is it is it we know why it's harder to go to an enemy than a friend but why is it more beneficial because you're carrying more ill will towards an enemy than anyone else and even though you kind of got over it in your four step if you can walk in and clean things up with that person and, and you have a handshake and and you know or a hug whatever the case may be you know and you walk away and that's a clean slate now you've got that whole situation patched up from your past and anytime you see that person out in public there's not going to be any animosity there for you anymore it's really powerful some people suggest when you do your ninth step you pick the three hardest people on the list and you do them first I think it's easier to start with the easy ones and build up to those but whatever way you want to do it it doesn't matter but that's why they suggest that because when you go do the hard ones first then you realize wow those weren't so tough and if I felt so good after doing those then all the more reason to do all the rest of them so it says we go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit confessing our ill feeling and expressing our regret a helpful and forgiving spirit what that means is you don't walk in and say I'm here to make an amends and I'm sorry for what I did but I did it because you were a jerk a helpful and forgiving spirit their faults aren't discussed at all under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue simply we tell him that we will never get over drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past we are there to sweep off our side of the street realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so never trying to tell him what he should do his faults are not discussed we stick to our own read that line over again his faults are not discussed we stick to our own if our manner is calm frank and open we will be gratified with the result most alcoholics owe money we do not dodge our creditors telling telling them what we are trying to do we make no bones about our drinking they usually know it anyway whether we think so or not we don't use that as an excuse or a reason for what we did we did what we did and that's what we did most people know there's something wrong anyway if you're living a good life and everything's fine for the past five or six years and all of a sudden you charge up twenty thousand dollars in vegas at some atm machine they probably figure you might be out on a binge so they know what's going on but also we don't shy away from disclosing our alcoholism in the theory that it may co cause financial harm it may be that by sharing if the question comes up by sharing what you're doing you can have a positive impact on this person you may be the only big book they ever see you may be able to carry the message of AA to that person and help them in their lives so don't be afraid to disclose that if the situation calls for it page 78 paragraph 2 six lines down page 78 paragraph 2 six lines down and it starts with approached in this way
approached in this way, the most, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise us. Arranging the best deal we, we can, we let these people know we are sorry. Our drinking, our drinking has made us slow to pay. We must lose our fear of creditors no matter how far we have to go. For we are able to for we are liable to drink if we are afraid to face them. Perhaps we have committed a criminal offense which might land us in jail if it were known to the authorities. We may be short in our accounts and unable to make good. We have already admitted this in confidence to another person, but we are sure we would be imprisoned or lose our job if it were known. Maybe it's only a petty offense such as padding the expense account. Most of us have done that sort of thing. Maybe we are divorced and have remarried but haven't kept up the alimony to number one. She is indignant about it and has a warrant out for our arrest. That's a common form of trouble too. Although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles which we find, gui which we find guiding. Reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience, we ask that we may be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. We, lose our, we may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. Okay, so what do you think the general principles are in that paragraph that guide us in working the ninth step? Willingness. So we've got to be able to persevere, right? Reminding ourselves that we've decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing. So we pray about it. We base ourselves in faith. Then it says, no matter what the personal consequences may be, we, lose our we may lose our position or our reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. It doesn't mean you go throw yourself on the steps of the courthouse and tell them you're an ax murderer, but you have to be willing to take whatever consequences come as the result of your past actions in order to be able to stay sober. We just have to be. So perseverance, prayer, trusting God, faith, and willingness. Those are the general guiding principles that we want to put into application and work in the ninth step. Usually, however, other people are involved. Therefore, we are not to be the hasty and foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. A man we know had remarried. Because of resentment and drinking, he had not, he had not paid alimony to his first wife. She was furious. She went to court and got an order for his arrest. He had commenced our way of life, had secured a position, and was getting his head above water. It would have been, it would have been pr impressive heroics if he had walked up to the judge and said, Here I am. We thought he ought to be willing to do that if necessary, but if he were in jail, he could, not, he could provide nothing for either family. We suggested he write his first wife admitting his faults and asking forgiveness. He did, and also sent a small amount of money. He told her what he would try to do in the future. He said he was perfectly willing to go to jail if she insisted. Of course, she did not, and the whole situation has long since been adjusted. Before taking drastic action, which might in implicate other people, we secure their consent. If we, if we have obtained permission, have consulted with others, ask God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. There's another pr guiding principle that he puts in in this paragraph. What do you suppose that is? What does he say in here about how we go about determining whether we need to make the amends or not? Consult with others. Very good. Very good. So one thing we want to do is we want to take our eighth step list to our sponsor, go through each person on the list and discuss the harm and discuss the amends that we think we ought to make and make sure that it's the appropriate amend to make. You may find a lot of people on your list that you think you owe an amend to that you actually don't. You may find some people on your list that you think you own a men to that if you went to them, it would actually hurt them more than help them. In those situations, we can't make the amends because we can't sacrifice somebody else's well-being to save our own butt. Willingness, perseverance, faith, and consulting with others. So far, that's the four guiding principles we have in working the ninth step. Skipping down page 81, halfway down the page. Page 81, first paragraph. Page 81, first paragraph. Whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. If we are sure our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, should we tell her in detail? 
Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. We feel we ought to, we, we feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we have done and, God willing, it shall not be repeated. More than that we cannot do. We have no right to go further. Though there may be justifiable ex exceptions, and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we have often found this the best course to take. So they shifted gears here. First they're talking about the person that, that has harmed us perhaps more than we harmed them, that we may still have a little bit of animosity towards. Then they talk about financial situations, and now they're talking about domestic situation. What we want to do is put these guiding principles into action. When it comes to infidelity and, and jealousy and, and things that come out of domestic situations, this is the hardest stuff in the world to deal with. So you want to be real cautious with who and how to approach in these situations. Let's get into page 82, halfway down the page. Page 82, paragraph 2. Page 82, paragraph 2. If we have no such complication, there's plenty we should do at home. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say that the only thing he needs to do is keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents whom for years he has so shockingly treated. Passing all understanding is the patience mothers and wives have had with alcoholics. Had this not been so, many of us would have no homes today, would perhaps be dead. Often in the ninth step meeting, when you go to a ninth step meeting, they're talking about making amends and who we need to make amends to, and there'll be somebody there that'll say, you know, the best amends that I can make to anybody I harmed is just to not drink today. You know, and I'm making an amends that way. The big book says that's not okay. Not enough just to stay sober. We've got to make a list, we've got to go back and track the people down that we've harmed, and we've got to make direct, direct amends to them. We've got to. We've just got to. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He's like the farmer who, come up, who came up out of this cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, Don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? Now that sounds like a great way for us on how to handle these situations, <laughs> but it just doesn't work when we think about what we started this whole thing with, which is that our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the world around us. Top of page 83. Page 83, top of the page. Yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful, a remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fill the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being careful not to criticize them. Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are that, their own act, that our own actions are partly responsible. So we, so we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our Creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would, that we would right them if we could. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. And there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases, but we do not delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scrapping. As, God, as God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. Then we've got the famous nine-step promises. You'll notice the key thing about the nine-step promises is on page 84, about halfway down the page, it says, are these extravagant promises, we think not, they are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. So if you stop at the ninth step, which is one of the trigger places that we get stuck in, and you don't go out and finish your amends list, the promises are going to be fleeting and short-lived in your life. You may start to experience them as a result of the other work you're doing, but they're just not going to stick around for you. We can't balk. We can't stop at anything. We may lose our job if we stand up and say, you know, I called in sick 30 times last year, you know, but I was drunk the whole time. We may. 
but you can't live long in the world if we don't own up to this stuff. In the book it says that the, the person who says I'm just going to stay sober, in other words I'm going to change my behavior, I'm going to do things differently, is like the farmer who comes up out of the storm cellar after the tornado destroys their whole house and looks around and goes, nothing wrong here. <laughs> it's great the wind stopped blowing, right? So I've been a jerk to you my whole life and I've done all these things and now I'm just not going to be a jerk anymore. And you should get over whatever resentment you have because of all the things I've done to you. We have no choice but to stay sober. We have no choice but to change our behavior. We can't live as selfish, self-centered people anymore. We can't do it. If we do, we'll drink and die. So that's not part of making the amends. That's just a byproduct of us staying sober. If the situation may be beneficial to say to the person, you know what, I'm an alcoholic, and that's what I was doing, because you think maybe they know somebody with a drinking problem, or they have a drinking problem, or somehow or some way it can be helpful, then you do that. But in most cases, they know you're a drunk anyways. So you can say to them, you know, part of my program of recovery is this ninth step thing. And so I need to make this amends to you, you know, in working that. And I'm really sorry for what I did to you. It was wrong. And I know that I hurt you through that. This is what I can do to try and set it right. Is that acceptable to you? That's the way a ninth step sounds. Or this is what I'm going to do, right? I owe you $500. I'm going to pay you $100 a month for the next five months. Is that acceptable to you? We can't make an amends to somebody to save our butts that could harm them, right? Like, for instance, this isn't your situation, but hypothetically, let's say you were married and you cheated, you know, and now you're divorced. And you're going to go back to this person. You've been separated for a couple of years, and you're going to say to him, you know, the whole time we were together we were married, I cheated on you. I cheated on you with the best friend, you know. I cheated on you with the pastor at the church. I cheated on you with your business partner. I cheated on you with all these people, and I'm really sorry. I've felt awful about it for years. You just ruined this person's life. Now you feel good, which is what counts the most, right? That's not what, that's not what the ninth step tells us. Okay, so in all of these questionable situations, when we're not sure how to handle them, we're not sure what we do, what are the guiding principles that the big book gives us in the ninth step? Consult with others, pray about it, perseverance, and willingness. Those are the guiding principles. If you put those principles to work on this situation, you'll have your answer as to what the right thing to do with the situation is. Whenever we've got any questionable situation in our life, if we pray about it, the right answer will come. What if you don't feel ashamed about what you did? In the reading of the ninth step, did we ever read a line where it said, we feel ashamed about these things and that's why we make amends for them? No, it never said that. So what we're basing our decisions on with doing the ninth step and what we're basing our, our eighth step list on has nothing to do with how we feel about the situation. What it has to do with is trying to repair the damaged relationships from the past so we can fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the world around us. It's everything we're trying to do here, the eighth step and the ninth step included, is to get rid of the things in ourselves which block us off from relationship with God and interfere in our relationships with others. Moving forward into the 10th step, halfway down the page on 84. Page 84, paragraph 2. Page 84, paragraph 2. This thought brings us to step 10. Which thought are we talking about? This thought brings us to step 10. Work. We can't pause throughout the working of the 12 steps and expect to have the results that we talked about after the ninth step. We're not going to have the ninth step promises come true in our lives if we stop working. We start working the 10th step literally after we take our fifth step. Because we do our fifth step, we do six and seven and eight in that hour or so that we take after we do our fifth step. And then we don't stop, we go out and start making our amends. And once we start making our amends, then we're doing a 10th step on a daily basis. Why do you suppose that is? Why is it that we continue immediately with the 10th step? There's no pause, there's no rest. You're continuing to clean house because you don't want your house to get dirty again. So the 10th step starts the night after you do your fifth step. You go do your fifth step, you get home, you do six, seven, and eight, you make a list of the people you harmed, you get ready to start making amends to them, and that night you take a 10th step. 
and he's going to give us specific directions on how to do the 10th step. This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along, meaning as we go along cleaning up the past. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. That's what we started in the third step. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. So what does that mean? What's understanding and effectiveness mean? In understanding how we're blocked off from a higher power. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. In understanding what God's will for us is in the world and effectiveness in putting that into practice. Right? That's what we're talking about. So the 10th step is the tool that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to see what aspects of self may be blocking us off from knowing what God's will is for us and how good a job we are doing it, putting God's will to work in our lives. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We've entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. So notice it doesn't say if these crop up. It says when these crop up. And what, are the, what is that list of words? Resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. What does that sound very similar to? The same things we talked about in the fourth step. Yeah, so the tenth step is just redoing the fourth step on a smaller scale. We're looking on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives to see how we're doing with the character defects that we identified in the fourth step. That's what the tenth step's all about. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. So that's a direction. The very first thing we do when we see that we're being selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, resentful, whatever it is, whatever the character defect is that we've identified, the very first thing we do is ask God at once to remove them. Discuss them with someone immediately. The next thing you do, so you say a little prayer about it, ask God to take away whatever the character defect is, call your sponsor or a friend in the program and say, you know what, this is what I'm doing. I just saw myself lying, I just started being dishonest with somebody, or I'm acting selfishly. Whatever it is, whatever's coming up for you, discuss it with somebody immediately. Make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. The next set of directions. So after you have a conversation with God about it, you see that you're being selfish, dishonest, or resentful, fearful, whatever the character defect is, you talk to God about it, you call your sponsor or somebody that you're close with in the program and tell them what you're doing. Sounds just like the fifth step, doesn't it? Make amends quickly if you've harmed anyone. There's the ninth step. And then resolutely turn your thoughts to someone that we can help. Why do you suppose he gives us that direction? What's the best thing we can do to get out of self? Work with another alcoholic. Work with another alcoholic, exactly. The best way to get out of selfishness or self-centeredness is to be of service to others. So when you see during the day at work that you're being a real jerk with the people at work, you talk to God about it. Call your sponsor and say, you know, I'm being a real jerk at work. Go to the people at work and make amends. And then go to the meeting, find a newcomer to work with, or listen in the meeting for somebody else that's suffering and try and share your experience with them. That's the prescription that the 10th step offers us. It doesn't say sit at work all day pissed off because you don't like what other people are doing. Go to the meeting and complain about it for 10 minutes. Go home, call three people and complain about it to them for 10 more minutes, and then watch TV. It doesn't say that. Those aren't the directions. Okay? So it says, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky, nor are we afraid. That is our experience. 
That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. What does it take to keep in fit spiritual condition? Working the 10th, 11th, and 12th step on a daily basis. It's the program of spiritual maintenance. That's what we're doing from this point forward. Maintaining our sobriety by maintaining our spiritual condition. So we read this paragraph from the bottom of 84 to the top of 85 when we first started the book workshop. We've now gone through those 24 pages that we keep referring to that encompass the main meat of the program of recovery. And at this point, we are recovered alcoholics. The mental obsession has been removed. We're placed in a state of neutrality as far as alcohol is concerned. And as long as we do what's necessary to maintain our spiritual condition, that's the place we stay in. That doesn't mean we're never going to be tempted. Doesn't mean we're never going to want to drink again. It says, if tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We're going to want to drink. It's going to happen. We're going to get tempted. But we're going to react differently because our defense against the first drink comes from a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. We have no mental defense against the first drink. We don't sit in an AA meeting and say, today I choose not to drink. Because I don't choose not to drink. Today I choose to take actions which provide me with a spiritual defense against taking the first drink. And that's the choice that I have. The choice not to take a drink comes when I woke up this morning and I didn't want to have to pray and meditate before I left the house. But I did. Because that's what I have to do to maintain my spiritual condition. Now, if I choose not to do the things to maintain my spiritual condition, then I've made the choice to drink. Because it's just a matter of when that's going to happen. Because I have no mental defense against the first drink. It's not coming back. So when you notice that you're off your spiritual condition, you notice that you're off the beam, what do you do? The same thing they told you in kindergarten when you were on fire. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, open the big book to page 84. Read the directions. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Take out a sheet of paper, turn it sideways, draw out your four columns, and write down your resentments, your fears, and if there's any sex harms that you've done since the last time you took an inventory. Just put them all down. Just do a mini fourth step right then and there. It'll take you 15 or 20 minutes. You've got the directions. You put them in the application for the rest of your life. Call your sponsor and say, I, I got some stuff I got to discuss with you. I took an inventory. Have a conversation with God. Ask that you get over whatever it is you're struggling with, with self-centeredness. Then resolutely turn your thoughts to how you can be of service to others. Go find somebody else to do 12-step work with. That's how we keep ourselves in fit spiritual condition. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. That means it's going to happen. You'll do it for three days straight, and then you won't do it for three days straight. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee, thy will, not mine, be done? These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It's the proper use of the will. Remember, we define the word will as thinking. So this is how the program works for us. We try to keep a, a vision of what God would have us be in the world in front of us. And we exercise our thinking along those lines all we wish. So what would God have me do today? God would have me carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to somebody else who's suffering from alcoholism. Now I'm going to spend my time thinking about ways in which I can do that. When I start off in the morning with a, a period of prayer and meditation, and I ask to be relieved from selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking motives, then I'm able to move forward in life and see where I can contribute and be of service rather than see how to get things to be the way I want it to be. Much has already been said about receiving strength and inspiration and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, we've begun to sense the flow of his, of his spirit into us. Notice this line, if we have carefully followed directions. Bill starts the entire big book, the entire thing starts off by saying it's a precise set of directions. Later he says, we're painstaking about this phase of our development. Painstaking means that we don't leave anything to chance. We really try and be as precise as possible in what we're doing. Now he's telling us that we've carefully followed directions, meaning we've adhered as strictly as we can to the directions that are given in the book. 
in the forward to the second edition, it says to those who, of those who come to AA and really tried, really tried to put the program into application. It's the same thing that he keeps repeating over and over for us. There's a set of directions, it's a specific program of action. We want to try and put it in application as best as we possibly can and as closely as we possibly can to what's intended for us to do. It's a specific set of directions. We want to follow it to the best of our ability. We're not going to be perfect at it, but we always want to try and follow it to the best of our ability. To some extent, we've become God conscious. We've begun to develop this vital sixth sense, but we must go further, and that means what? More action. So we're ending step 10 on, on page 85. So actually, he's going to give us some other directions that have to do with step 10 in a moment, but we follow step 10 up by more action. Everything's followed up with more action. So there's three types of 10-step inventories that we've listed. The first is the spot check inventory. Throughout your day, you pause. Check in and see where you're at. Are we agitated? Are we doubtful? Are we acting selfishly? Is there something going wrong? During the spot check inventory, if you see anything out of whack, you go back and you do the directions that he gives us in the 10-step. Pray about it. Talk to another person. Discuss what's going on. Make amends quickly if you've harmed anyone, and then look to see what you can contribute or you can be of service. The second inventory is the end of the day inventory, which is the thing we do at night when we retire. Before we go to sleep, we review our day constructively, looking to see if we were acting on self most of the time or how good a job we were doing at putting these principles into application. We're not taking that inventory at the end of the day to find out if we're wrong or bad. We're taking it to find out how good a job we're doing at work in the program in our life. Our next function, he told us, is to grow in understanding and effectiveness of putting God's will to work in our life. So it's essentially saying that our next function is to develop the third step and the decision we made on a regular basis in our lives. So what we're going to do is on a day-to-day -day basis is check in and see how good a job we're doing at that. So then the third type of 10th step inventory, which we discussed earlier, is to redo essentially a fourth step. Take a look at life, what's going on. In the 10th step in the 12 and 12, he says that that many of our fellowship go out for regular, annual, or routine house cleanings. So we sit down, we write a full inventory, we look at what's going on in our lives, we check to see if we've got any resentments, any fears, or if there's any sex situations that we need to clean up. So we do that on a regular basis so that we can keep our house clean. So those are the three types or the three ways in which we work the 10th step. So moving forward into the chapter working with others, once again, there is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. So you can believe in God all day long, but if you're not carrying the message of AA or, or trying to be of service to others, then you're missing half the program. And chances are it's going to be hard to stay sober. The direction for taking the 10th step is in the second paragraph on page 84, starting with the second line. Right in the middle of the line, it says, we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Now, will those who are ready to take the 10th step please stand? Here is our 10th step question. Will you continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as you go along? Yes, I will. Congratulations. Done it again. 